all. Welcome to the session on Midfield Masterclass. Um, really privileged to be joined by two midfield experts in Paul Davis and Jordan Nobbs, both Arsenal through and through. So it should be a really interesting discussion about their midfield experiences, um, players they've really enjoyed playing with, players they've feared to play against, and some of the um, the evolution of the systems that we've had in midfield over the last 30 years. And then some work on or, or some discussion on, on coaches and what players expect from coaches, how they thrive the most, uh, maybe what some of the elements that infuriate them and the discussion uh, should be a really good one. Uh, Paul Davis, 15 years at Arsenal, um, outstanding, elegant, left-footed midfield player, two league titles, FA Cup, two league cups and a European Cup Winners' Cup on his list of uh, achievements, 450-plus games at Arsenal. Um, fantastic player, uh, role model for future generations of players, um, and now a, a coach <clears throat> and a steam coach, now coach educator at the FA. So it's great to have Paul with us. And he'll talk about his background in a second. Um, and Jordan Nobbs is with us as well, which is fantastic. We're pleased he's, we're able to get some time out of a, 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 a training schedule. Jordan broke into Sunderland's first team at the, at the young age of 16, um, played an FA Cup final in her first few years as a, as a professional footballer, and then joined Arsenal in 2010. Ten years later, she's got three league titles under her belt, four FA Cup, five League Cups and 60 England caps. Um, Jordan, just talk us through the last, I don't know, it's more than 12 years, isn't it, since you started playing football, about your experiences in midfield. How would you describe your, your career to date? It's scary. I'm getting old now that these uh, years are getting added on. But, um, no, I mean, I've been very lucky to be in... Uh, a stage where I guess we went from a non-professional environment to then, you know, joining a club like Arsenal and the women's game just changing as a whole, which I think, you know, allowed me and, I mean, I guess many other women at this time to start being professional and be allowed to train every day, you know, get everything needed and enjoy just doing what they love. Um, I think, obviously, my biggest achievement was moving at the age of 17 to Arsenal and, you know, getting my my foot through the door and onto that pitch pretty soon um after that and you know I think when you're playing with um what we would still call now legends of the game um in an Arsenal team it can only make you better and stronger and, and fitter and more competitive so I was very lucky to kind of grow up in that environment um you know and then obviously I've been part of the England squad uh suffered a few injuries along the way but you know I think overall I've thoroughly enjoyed my career um up to now and um you know I, I hope that I can keep being a role model for the women's game now and um you know ho hopefully a few more years left to go I'm sure you have I'm sure you have um Paul do you want to give us a summary of your midfield career today and your, your background yeah sure thanks uh thanks Jamie yeah and I'll, uh, I've had um seems such a long time now since I stopped playing. So I joined Arsenal when I was um, 13 years of age, uh, back in the 70s, uh, late 70s. Um, and it was just a dream because I supported Arsenal as a kid, as, a, as an 11-year-old. Um, and to eventually be able to play for them is, you know, it's like everybody's dream. So it's something that... I still think about now, even finishing playing now. I finished playing in 90, 96, 1996, which is a long time now. But you, you still look back and look back on your achievements and to have played for your team that you supported for such a long time. It's it's quite extraordinary to look back on. So, yeah, it's it was... Um, Started from the age of 13 when I first went down to Ivory. I used to train at the back of the the, uh, the the clock end, it was called back then. And that was the, obviously the original stadium. And did that for a couple of years and then got my apprenticeship at 16, which was obviously a big milestone for any, any young player. Then signed at 14, sorry, signed at 17 as a professional 
and made my debut at 17 and a half. So it all kind of came quickly. And then, you know, sort of breaking into the team and, you know, trying to establish yourself, establish yourself back then. So they were talking about early 80s um, and, and um, sort of having to fight for a place in the team with people like Liam, Bla Liam Brady and Alan Hudson, for those who older people on the call that remember these names. But, you know, to to kind of get through all, all of that and then establish yourself in in a in an Arsenal team that was struggling at the start, I have to say, early 80s, we didn't look as though we were going to sort of win anything back then. Uh, we had people like Graham Ricks in the team. That's a good player, but we just weren't solid as a, as a, as a as a team, Paul Mariner played and um, Willie Young. There's so many names I can go yeah. back on, but those are the sort of people that were, uh, they were older players, but they were more established and they're the players that kind of I had to um, learn to play with. So then, yeah, it sort of carried on all the way through then. Um, through the, through the 90s, well, let's say the 80s, through to the 90s. And in the end, you know, finish up playing, like you, like you mentioned, Jamie, 450 games um, and winning, you know, winning the leagues and then the Cups and then the European Cup. Mm. Uh, well, it was it's the equivalent to the Europa Cup. <laughs> it's not the Champions League, but no. it's still a it's European Cup. European but, Cup. Um, huh? How would you how would you describe yourself, Paul, as a as a footballer? If you look back now, how would you describe how you played the game? What would you like to be? I don't know the strap line that would describe Paul Davis, the footballer. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I felt that it, I, I struggled to fit in at the start. I really did, and, I, and it took about into the first team. This this is it took about eighteen months to really fit in to the team and the fans. Because um, my style seemed to be different from what they were expecting or what they wanted or what they're demanding. Um, and I thought I was, well, I always gave my all, but it, often sometimes it looks as I wasn't. Yeah. Um, so I had this kind of style that wasn't, it, it just wasn't a norm because it wasn't like tearing around and trying to get tackles. You know, it wasn't like that sort of game. It wasn't 100 miles an hour. That wasn't my game. And it was, it was quite interesting that period where for 18 months when I was in the first team, really struggling with the fans and to be accepted in terms of the way that I played. And as the years went on, I kind of realised, and that was a real tough period for me because to try and establish yourself when you're kind of feeling that you're not, the fans are not with you. Um, so there was a tough time for me. Um, and it was only because my style was different. It wasn't that I wasn't trying. It wasn't that I didn't care. Because obviously I cared because it was, uh, it's my club. But uh, it was the way I was playing. My, my game was a passing game. It wasn't sort of tearing around. I would think about things. It was if I didn't need to run there, I, w I wouldn't run there because there was no need to, you know. So it was it was something I feel that the fans weren't used to particularly at that say that my type of game mm. um so yeah it was, a, it was a struggle to start with but um i think they after a while they, i won them over yeah that's really but I definitely did, yeah. yeah that's really interesting i'm sure we'll come back to some of those points today as we worked through having a chat about playing midfield jordan how would you how would you describe yourself as a player uh I'm very competitive. Uh, I think even away from football, I'm competitive and probably very annoying. Actually, um, I think I'm I'm quite known for my engine, um, and I think that's kind of pushed me to the next level of you know wanting to get on the ball and having then I guess the repetition of being able to do it over and over again, um, and then probably my my long range shooting. Um, got over like 50 goals for Arsenal and I think the majority of them are from quite far out. So, uh, yeah, and I'd like to hope that, you know, I was a winner for the team, you know, 
winning trophies and that's why I came to the club to push myself to the next level and you know want to win everything as a player and I mean you know you love wearing the Arsenal shirt anyway but I think the fact that you get to win trophies with them is um you know the highlight of any footballer hmm. and how how could you both kind of summarize what it means to play for Arsenal it's obviously an esteemed club with a great history isn't it what does it actually what does it actually mean to play for the club yeah, for me, it was, like I said earlier, I think when you're a supporter of a, a club and then you are able to play for that club, it's, it just makes it that much special, more special, I think. And and for my club to be Arsenal, which is a big, big club, and to do that, it's um, something that you kind of live with all your life and think about. I think about it all the time and feel how like lucky I am to have that opportunity and to mm. take take the opportunity that was given to me at the times, at the various times in my career. Um, so, yeah, tremendous pride um, for myself, for my family. My mum always, my, always my mum always been thinking she was like so made up. She came from um, sort of humble beginnings in Jamaica, came over to England in sort of late 50s, um, trying to find her own way in England, really, because it was tough for her. Um, and she brought us up on her own, myself and my sister, um, in South London. And it was tough for her. So for her to see her son sort of, you know, graduate in football, and she didn't really know a lot about football. And I remember having to try and convince her this is this is a decent career. <laughs> uh, she, weren't, she weren't too sure. I remember it, still remember it. Clearly, but um, now things like that you kind of um, think back on, especially when once you've finished and you you realise what big club it was, how much people um, recognise that, and you sort of appreciate your achievements um, once you stop. I think, and I definitely do that now. You know, people still stop me and talk about the career and what you did at that time. Um, and interestingly, you know, it's all types of people, you know, people that were born and brought up over here, people that were born and brought up in Jamaica, where my parents are from. And and I think those kind of things you don't really realise when you're playing, because obviously you just you just concentrate on, on your game. But as as time goes, you realise that these these things are quite momentous, really. There's a lot. Of people watching you, um, and so you know, it wasn't too many years afterwards that I realised there was a big following of what I was doing from the sort of Afro Caribbean community. Mm. I just, you know, I'm just playing football. I don't, I'm not sort of looking at any. But then now people come up to me like I'm only supporting Arsenal because you were playing. Mm. <laughs> like it's you know really, yeah. Uh, really sort of significant things in people's lives you don't realise until afterwards and people and you've got the time to talk to people and realise actually this is massive you know you're not just playing football you're affecting so many lives and yeah. so, um, that's when it really has it on for me after I finished playing yeah, but Jordan sure. at that stage I don't think <laughs> no I'm, well, I'm going to flick over to Jordan now I'm sure it's really interesting I'm sure the same will be uh, applying to yourself will it in terms of you know, that you are a role model, even like Paul said, you probably don't recognise that when you're in the midst of your playing career, aren't you? not even reached your peak yet, I suppose, you know? How would you sum up playing for Arsenal and what, that, what has that meant to you? Um, I mean, it's just a, a dream. I mean, uh, I'd like to hope that the fact that this is my 10th year at the club, um, that, you know, I'm, I came from a, the North East as a nobody and I'd like to hope that, I'm an Arsenal legend and that's kind of how I want my career to go. I want to be known as she played for, you know, 13, 14, 15 years as as an Arsenal player and um, showed loyalty to the club. And the reason I do that is because when I came as a 17-year-old, I, I went back home and obviously had decisions to make of moving from Sunderland then uh, for the Women's Super League. And I was just like, Dad, I cannot go anywhere else but Arsenal. Um, you know, and obviously you then have the shirt you know I was very very lucky to get number eight and they're the little things that you just 
you don't ever want to take for granted because of the people who've wore that shirt before you. And I mean, I've just enjoyed every minute and they've, you know, allowed me to be the player and person I am today, I think, with just the way they act and the way we play football as well. It's, uh, you know, it's exciting to, to play football and it's just been a, a dream, really, I think, mm-hmm. to wear a shirt for us one cap, but to, you know, now be on my 200 um, cap, it's just been a great career journey for me and I can't thank Arsenal enough for that. Yeah, good. Do you want to do you want to expand a little bit on that then, and how how you think your games developed? Well, not only being at Arsenal but playing for England. Who who are the players that again? I suppose me and Paul grew grew up through an era where the players were the main source of inspiration for you as a they were the main players that coached you pretty much. You know, um, what which are the players that have had the biggest influence on you? Well, not only ones that you maybe watched on TV, but then one players that you've played with. Which are the key midfield players that that influence how you played the game? Uh, Kim Little, who is at Arsenal now, uh, she's our captain. When I joined at the age of 17, she was that like tippy tappy player that, you know, I mean, it's just a dream when you want to play like that. And I like to play like that. And um, I mean, her talent and goal scoring ability, I mean, her stats on goals per games is ridiculous. And um, she's just one of them players that, you know, whether it was five a side or a game, you wanted to have her in your team because you were probably. 70% 70% going to win just by having her. Um, and I think when you have players that get like that, you know, you start to work on your touch, your awareness. You know that you can always support her because she's going to be, you know, giving you a little ball and going and getting it again. And I guess it's them little details that allow you to progress as a player. But um, I was very, very lucky at the time I went to Arsenal. There was multiple players there. Kelly Smith, Alex Scott, Rachel Yankee. I mean, uh, the list was kind of endless in them pushing me to become the player I could be because I I probably went to from a Sun a Sunderland team that was very much relied on the fit young players to just kind of you know win a game really um whereas when you got to Arsenal um it was more technical it was more tactical uh you had to defend or else you'd get shouted at uh and that's what makes you the the best player you can be, really, when you have them more experienced players around you to push you. Thanks, Jordan and Paul. Who be the who be the players that really influenced influenced your career and watching uh, as you were growing up in South London, as you said, you know, and then when you got into the Arsenal team or in around the Arsenal setup, which players really influenced your game? Mm. Yeah. So before I got it. Well, before I got chosen to have a trial at Arsenal, I suppose um, I remember watching sort of match of the day, and and it was a there was a player called Clyde Beth. Some some of our folks might remember who played for West Ham, and he was a forward, and he came from the West Indies. Yeah, big big guy, and um, he he was somebody that I could identify with, and I felt that. I there was a chance of me actually making a career. Um, so he was the first one as a as a footballer over here that I, I felt inspired me. And then um obviously back then it was Pele. Pele was around in terms of playing for Brazil and the world's best player, but obviously it isn't like it is now where you can see games from abroad. So I only saw Pele in the sort of World Cups, more or less. So uh, you didn't really see much of him, but you heard you heard of him. So those two were really the two that kind of inspired me and felt that you know, I could, you know, I could see those guys there. I could, I could get there. And then, and then once I got to Arsenal, it was people like Liam Brady was there, um, and then Alan Ball was around. Um, and so, yeah, that, those were the guys that really I looked up to and inspired me earlier on in my career. But um, it's uh, it's really difficult to to break through. Well, I found it really difficult to break through at Arsenal because it was so uh, such a big club and so many big names there. You really had to have a, 
a mindset. And I think I, I mentioned that in my article, the article that you mentioned earlier. I think you had to really, it wasn't about my ability. It was about ability, but it was just as much about how I sorted my mind out. And I figured that out. I think I figured that out really pretty early. I must be maybe about, I don't know, 12, 13, 13 maybe where I thought it's, there's more to this than just ability. You've got to have something in my mind that kind of gets me through a lot of these tricky situations that I was coming across. Mm-hmm. Um, but as for, as for heroes, I would be those, those guys, um, Clyde Bess and Pele. And then once I got into Arsenal, I'd be, um, like I say, um, Liam Brady, definitely. Um, it's Wait. interesting. So it's interesting with Liam because Liam was my hero once I got to Arsenal, but then he, he we played in the same position. So I was then having to try to get him out the team basically to get into the team. Uh, so it's re- that was a real strange one. Um, fortunately for me, because for those people that don't, Liam, I know you know Liam or you, you know of Liam Robo, but people that don't know Liam, he was. Fantastic player. I, f- I think the closest player that's like him at the moment would be somebody like De Bruyne, I would say. Um, very, very similar type of game. Probably a bit more of a dribbler, but that type of player, sort of world-class player. Um, so I had to try to get him out of the team to get in. So, But fortunately for me, he, he, he moved on to Juventus which left the opening for me to, to try and break into. And that was, that was my breakthrough. Mm-hmm. And how interested, Paul, uh, and I'll come to Jordan first on this question, how interested, sorry, how pivotal has it been to build up a good partnership with one or clearly you, Jordan talked about Kim Little who might play, I don't know, slightly more in advance of you. What about midfield partnerships? How important has that been in your, in your career today, either a two or a three? Yeah, uh, I mean, traditionally we have, well, at both uh, Sunderland and Arsenal, it was a four, uh, four, three, three. Uh, whether that was the manager's side on two sitting, kind of a typical number eight box to box, which was normally me. Um, and then obviously uh, you then have one sitting and two higher. But I think the more you change and swap your midfield, it is difficult to get that kind of continuity on, you know, the way you play, how you like to move, whether you're making a run in behind. Um, I definitely think in my game, the the late runs in behind into the back line were, were key. And I think you then need to know, you know, who's supporting the ball or, or moving around you. Um, and I think when I got to Arsenal, it was uh, Katie Chapman as a um, sitting midfielder with me and Kim. Um, you know, she kind of did the, the stuff that people didn't really notice, the tackling, the heading. And then obviously me and Kim, you know, we're, we're smaller players and then she'd give us the ball and we were just free to then play and combine. And, um, you know, you need them them key elements, which actually are sometimes more important than the person scoring the goals. So we were very lucky with, with that three. I think that's been, um, you know, a great learning experience, having them two experienced players around me. Yeah, good. Fascinating. What about you, Paul? Midfield partners who stands out in your career at... Arsenal. Yeah, it's um because I was there for such a long time. I played with so many different types of players. Um, I think that was probably one of the things that I learned to do very quickly was adapt to different um, partners. So when I started in the early eighties, I was playing with people like um, Brian Talbot. David Price, um, Liam Liam Brady for a while, Graham Ricks, and they're all different different types of players. So Brian Tubble was more, so he, he he had a sort of had lots of energy, could run, um, could tackle. Liam was somebody who's completely different, just you know, just technically outstanding, could pass dribbles, so that he. He was different. So everyone, everybody was different. And um, so it just, you just probably adapt, I adapted my game 
to whoever I was playing with. So, but by and large, we played just two sort of old in midfielders, generally speaking, and then one would go and one would stay. And it was often 4 4 2. We didn't change systems, particularly in the early days. It was always 4 4 2. I'm sure you played, you played in that sort of system, Rob, by yourself, I think. So, yeah. you know, we kind of, it was set, set, set um, formations every week. It's just, a, just the personnel might have been slightly different, but the shape of the team was always 4 4 2. The two wider midfield players were almost like wingers, but then they had to tuck back in into midfield when we, had, we didn't have the ball to make a solid four in midfield. Um, so, yeah, and then generally generally speaking, we had two players up front who were out and out strikers. We didn't have one playing off of each other like it is now. It's pretty much... Um, and, and really, we weren't that much different to other teams. Other teams were doing the same stuff as well, so it was... It wasn't like like of midfield players. I suppose one thing for us when I played alongside somebody, it'd be generally one of us would be looking to get in the box all the time to sports. and one would be always looking to just obviously support the play and never wanted both both your old in midfield players going at the same time. So it's sort of Knowing what your partner was doing, and if, if your partner had gone into the box, obviously you, you're not going to go into the box. Um, and similarly, if you, you, you both need to defend, but only one could go into the box. Uh, that was how we generally worked for the majority of time that I was at Arsenal. Um, yeah, I don't even, even with George Graham, sort of late on in my career, it was pretty much the same. Systems didn't change that much. We did play three at the back, four in midfield and three up front um, for a little bit. But by and large, it's four four two. When when you hear Paul describing the four four two system like that, Jordan, how does it how does it make you feel? Because obviously, I described A.T. Chapman and and yourself and uh, and and Kim are seem much more fluid and dynamic you know is that what does that resonate with you in terms of how you've seen football over the last you know well you said you started playing football at seven in the last 20 years you know how, how have you seen the structure of the evolvement of midfield i'd say um you know we were pretty similar with paul one would be sitting and then it would be you know who's kind of on the edge of the box or getting in the box and obviously moving off each other. Um, I'd just say in the women's game, we've just now created a, a better environment to give more detail, more analysis. Um, you know, are you turning on the ball in midfield rather than going backwards? Whereas, you know, 10 years ago at Sunderland, we had a few training sessions. Uh, you know, sometimes the games wouldn't even be recorded or on telly or anything. Whereas now, you know, we, we have that luxury of being able to watch games back and seeing that our movement moves, moves off each other. But I think, especially from a manager's side of thing, I think a, a bit like what Paul said, he, obviously we've both been at clubs for a long time and you end up with different midfielders. I think it's then key for the manager, obviously bringing in them types of players. If, you know, at Arsenal, we obviously want to play with the ball, you know, so when you're bringing in players, they've got to, you know, want the ball. But then I think you also need the manager to quickly get them on track with how you play so you can then, you know, work with them and, kind of have your role clarity but then your freedom within that um but I think uh Joe Arsenal I think he's kind of took us to a new level of especially coaching to then allow yourself as a midfielder where you're supporting the ball um he calls them style rules um and they sound so simple and basic but actually they're so key into allowing you to not lose the ball so obviously the stats on if you play square ball you know the stat is very high to get counter-attacked on and actually concede a goal. And, you know, if we do a square ball in training, he will not stop shouting it. And, you know, it's the littlest thing and it sounds so basic, but actually when you do play square ball in a football match, you'll soon realise how players, it's so easy for them just to judge and cut in and run with it. Um, 
So I think little things like that we've now, especially in the women's game, we've just got more knowledge to um, adapt our game and, and change it to what we need. And in terms of your ability as uh, or your mentality to get on the ball and keep playing and keep playing forward. You know, you talk, you sort of started talking there about, you know, receiving on the half turn and trying to play forward, you know. How's, how's your game evolved over the last 10 years of playing football at the highest level? You know, you clearly said you, you'd want to be known for your engine and your, your long-range shooting, but clearly your, your awareness, your receiving skills are, are also world-class as well. You know, how have they evolved over time? I'd say the main thing is um, I think because I am a, a fit player and I can run, you know, I ended up doing either other people's jobs or actually getting in other people's spaces probably. And then as time's evolved and, you know, you obviously uh, the coaching gets better and everything like that, I started to time my runs better, you know, make more decisive runs into the back line rather than maybe doing it two or three times. It would be that one time that was actually going to create a goal scoring scenario for, for us. Um, I mean, I am a player that I love to get on the ball. I couldn't care less if I was running and getting off the goalkeeper and then just making a pass and then getting out again. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of what's made me, um, I guess, a good player in the WSL, you know, my ball retention and wanting to get on the ball. But I think knowing where and when to get on it and sometimes creating space for others, that's also key that I think as you gain experience and play with players, you know, you can, um, I've definitely developed that. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the other question we had at the start, I don't know whether you wanted to answer it just on this then. What, what are some of the the opponents, and you might not want to name them as such, you know, who are the opponents that you feared the most or cause you the most problem or the most challenge in, you, in your career today? And what, what sort of things have they, have they done that would really disturb your game and think, God, we've, we got a job on here today. I was thinking about it. And, I mean, uh, sorry, this is probably isn't the perfect answer, but when we played Germany, um, their midfield, just as a whole, mm. the way they, you know, one will literally move one side of you and then next minute there's one the other side of you. And the way they move and work together, and especially because they're very strong, powerful players as well, they're just a really difficult midfield to keep on top of and um you know the way they get their body in the way of the ball is uh is very difficult and I think whenever we've played them their midfield has been very dominant and um the way they move to get on the ball is is very hard to play against. Um I'd probably say for players I like G who plays for Chelsea. She's a very um just wants to get on the ball and she's quite um sounds a little bit like what Paul said of you know, not running everywhere, but she's just very smooth and, you know, touches on the ball and uh, she can pick out passes from anywhere. So she's been a player that I think has been uh, crucial for Chelsea's team. Good, thanks. Dave, who are your midfield opponents? Again, I mentioned Glenn Hoddle at the time. I've obviously mm. known you for 15 or so years. I had some great conversations about you about your playing career. It's fascinating to get Jordan's take as well on some of those players in, in the women's game over the last few years. Who, who, going back to your day, who is your most difficult opponent? Yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, the hardest one was definitely Glenn Oddle, but there was so many players around those days. Um, Brian Robson was always difficult, but diff in a different way. Brian was up and down. He, he had the energy, he had the determination to get on the end of stuff. And if he didn't stay with him, he knew he'd find a way of getting into a goal scoring position. So he he was he was always a tough, tough person to play against. Um Paul Paul Gascoigne, um played against him many, many times, but again, he was so strong and prepared to to try things, really, really cheeky stuff, trying to put balls for your legs and all that sort of stuff. You know. But add, add ability as well could dribble, as we all know. But, um, you know, so many, we've had so many great midfield players in this country. Paul Scholes, you know, he's outstanding. I suppose I didn't play against him as much because he probably was coming towards perhaps the end of my career when he was starting. But really some talented players. But, yeah, Glenn, I always say Glenn, Glenn Oddle because 
I always feared, I, I talk about not fearing playing out onto pitch, but there was always something in the back of my mind when I was playing against Glenn that he, he, the main thing for me about Glenn was his two footedness. He was equally just, I don't know if you've played against anyone, Jordan, or if there's anyone in the women's game that has actually just naturally, they're both, both footed and it, it just stumped me because I normally when you're playing against somebody, obviously you know which side they want to go to and you can, you know, you can play towards that. But Glenn was just just so talented, naturally talented. And then the vision they had and then the technique along with it. <laughs> so with all those things, you know, to be able to deliver on all those three things, not many people can do that and Glenn could do it. So, I was always fearful against, and I was always up against him. He was always the one that you know, I had to try and mark. And um, he done some unbelievable stuff uh, against us. And whenever I'd watch him play, just little subtle things that he would do, and he'd make a yard of space by doing that. And and then once he'd made that yard of space, he, the, the killer ball or the, the, the goal or whatever it is, he wasn't going to, like you talked about passing square, Jordan. He, he ain't passing square. He's he's going to make that killer pass if he's made that space. He's always looking for it. And, yeah, so he wasn't a great tackler, but he didn't need to be. And um, he, he just saw things and was able to enact it. You know, you see you see players that see things but then can't deliver it <laughs> or they, they can't create the space or they can't do this. But he, he just had, he had everything. But... It was it was a pretty pretty sad situation really because he should have played more for England, Glenn. And it was a it was a, we were at a time then where his type of talent wasn't appreciated. It was that it was in that era of the game. I think now, obviously, that type of player is is just lauded now, and he would have been superstar. He was then, but I think it wasn't it wasn't sort of the vogue that type of player. Um, Brian Robson was completely different in terms of his style. Still a great player, really 100%, you know, determination, um, you know, still had skill in that, but it wasn't wasn't the same level as, as Glenn. But um, Brian, was, Brian was the one, I don't know the, the England caps that they made, but Brian would have been a lot more than Glenn because that was the type of player. I mean, Robert, you must have watched them as well. You, I don't know what you felt about those guys. Yeah, and yeah. I think growing up in that period from the eighties, we had, you know, Robson. I'd say like Peter Reid and Ray Swell and you know Matt Marn and Whelan at Liverpool, and obviously your, your, yourself and other players around that era the, in the eighties. And then going into the nineties, you say when you get into the Skulls and the Man United era, you know, had some, we've had some fantastic centre midfield players in this country that. Again, it's it's great chatting to you two because even in the description at the start, you know, you describe yourselves as very different different players in a lot of ways, but know yourself and know what you're all about, you know, know how to get the best out of yourselves. Um, I think we're probably are right, Paul, in terms of like the, how the game's evolved and it'll be interesting on Jordan's take on it. It's certainly become more more technical in midfield, doesn't it? There's more of a desire to get on the ball. You know, pitches have improved. The football, the quality of the actual footballs have improved, you know, to be able to play you know, more possession-based style, but still not taking away the kind of physicality of the game. Um, Jordan, what, what, what's your take on how, how, the, how the women's games improved in midfield over, over your career? Is it more te- technical focus? Obviously, we're going to have another fantastic World Cup campaign. You know, what are the things we need to do to go that, that step further, do you think? Is the midfields are clearly a crucial area. What, what do you think? What, are, what things do you think have improved? What things do you think we still need to get better in? in the centre midfield sort of area? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I always like to see the midfielders like being described as, I guess, the, the heartbeat of the team. You know, they're the ones that get off the back line. They also support the, the forward line um, and they're crucial into to making that. Um, I think if I went back to probably when I first joined England as a, as a kid, um, you know, everything was very, right, one here, one maker running behind, you know, and it was very, very structured. And then you kind of like, well, why am I running behind? Because, you know, you're not creating anything. It, at the time, it was like, it was just like doing a mannequin drill. And I think now we've obviously developed, uh, 
everyone's got different tactics, different ways of playing that you have to adapt to quickly as a midfielder. Um, you know, whether you're pressing high up the pitch or, or not. Um, I think that the main thing probably going off the national team, um, you know, we weren't playing enough football to compete with the best. Whereas now we've been playing, training, getting fitter. Um, but I think the key bit is now our mentality, you know, believing that we're going to win, um, being fearless, kind of wanting to get on the ball and, and knowing that we now have ticked more boxes to to be the best team, you know, in, in the world. And um, I think with Arsenal as well, it's it's a bit like that with Champions League. Um, I'd say in Champions League, it's more the physical side a little bit. Um, so we need to obviously... Our strength is is get keeping the ball, moving the ball quickly, um, and I guess just the adaptations has just been everything's become more professional, and um, I think you need to know knowledge of the game. I think you need to, as a kid, watch football matches and watch yourself and see how you can improve, how you can, um, you know, because it's not so structured anymore. There is freedom. You know, you want a framework, but you want freedom within that framework to allow the best of you to come out of that. Um, but I think it's then known, uh, like Paul said, are you playing against the left or right footer? Because it might just change whether you press that little bit quicker or actually you just show them onto their right foot or left foot. And that can be a key element of of winning the ball back for your team. Hmm. And if we flick on to the next slide, which is Paul's comment in the um, in the article on Boot Room, which I'm sure we'll send a link around associated to this to this webinar. It's it's a fascinating read. Um, how, what what does this mean to you, Jordan? Just in terms of like being positive, the mindset. You know, you, you Paul saying he, he wasn't fearful at all. You know, you, you explained a little bit like that earlier on in our discussion. And what does this you just mentioned there about about being brave? You know, what what, what do some of the words in Paul's quote here mean to you? I think the the kind of mindset and psychology side of it is now a key element in football. Um, I think it's just as key as, you know, having talent, you need to have the right mindset. And I mean, I think, you know, you want that little bit of fear and that little bit of like, oh, I need to beat this person. And, you know, I'm worrying a little bit about this. But I think you've got to believe in yourself, um, no matter what anyone says. And, you want to get on the ball, you want to do the best for your team, but um, I think your mindset is actually crucial into allowing you to be the best player. I think, you know, we probably Paul's experienced it as well. You you see talent go by and they don't have the right mindset and they always fall behind. Um, and actually some with the right mindset takes them further than places you maybe think they would when they were younger. Um, and I think that's a key element, especially in the women's game, going from the transition of non, you know, non-professional to professional, you know, how are you adapting um, and coping with everything that's going on and, um, you know, how things are changing so quickly and the competition now is, you know, the starting 11 don't play week in, week out. It's, there's more games now, there's, there's more people to take your spot. Um, and I think the, the fear of that is, uh, believing in yourself and, and having the the bravery to, you know, overcome them ob obstacles and uh, push yourself to that next level. Mm. And, you, and you think when you're playing midfield, me and Paul have, have chatted about this at length, that sometimes there's, you can show for the ball and be available, but you're not quite available. You know, you're not quite given an angle, you know, and sometimes that seeps into the way that we play, you know, the, um, as a, as a, not as a, just as a national team, but the way we play, we play the game. Sometimes we we prefer to play a less riskier pass than try and play through midfield. How does that? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that can happen. You know, some games kind of pass you by, and then other games you need to grab them by the the rough of the neck and um, you know make a difference in a in a stand. But I think that's down to you as players wanting the ball, showing a good angle, asking for the ball. Um, and then also, I think the the role clarity from your manager. You know, are you a are you is your keeper giving it to your back line, and then you know you want that long ball forward for a running behind, or is it actually trust each other? You know, have lines of pass to to get on the ball and and support each other. But 
I think as players, you need a little bit of more clarity on that um, to then allow you to then make the right decision as a player. So, you know, I've been given the responsibility to get on the ball, but, you know, am I seeing that my other midfielder's gone in there? I don't need to do that yet. I can stay in the pocket of the 10 and I can wait and, you know, maybe the second or third pass, it'll it'll come to me. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... Uh, I think that's like what Paul's wrote here, though. It's it's bravery to get on the ball. Um, I think if I was a, a coach, like I think one of my main things would just be show an angle to get on the ball, whether that's higher up the pitch, you know, lower your body shape. You know, it's the reason we play football. We want to score goals. We want to kick the ball. Um, you know, I think that would be my attitude towards that. Hmm. Good. Great. And Paul, is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah. Uh, your quote and then we'll move into the last bit which is about just about coaching between the structure you know john's yeah. already mentioned there a bit about structure and freedom so is paul you want, anything you want to add to this quote yeah I, w- I will do jamie i just want to go back a little bit off if i may about the the you know when we talked about you mentioned about the pitches back back in back in the day when, when we were playing and how much the pitches have changed and how that affects how we played the game back then so you know, I remember playing on some horrendous pitches where there's no way you could try to play football. Um, and, if it, you know, I look at some of the clips from the old days now and it's amazing that we were able to play. <laughs> and Jamie, you, you'd, have, you'd have played on some of the pitches. It's like, I'm sure some of the players now don't. I don't know, Jordan, have you seen some of the pitches from back in the 70s that we used to play on? Um, like, Football and right. what talked about is how good we have it now without the leather footballs and he said he had football studs that were like this long and yeah. Yeah. so yeah that was I mean that, that is one thing I kind of look back on and think now how much it's changed and how much that affects the game and it's for the better obviously the pitches are good and, and players can show their skills and then the other thing is the, the rule changes so you know the game has changed uh, from when I started out, mainly as well because of the rule changes. You know, some some of the tackles that players yeah. were able to get away with. Right <laughs> now, yeah. you, you, you know, yeah. there's no way. Yeah. The tackle from behind, Paul, when we when that rule changed, is a massive change in the game because you used to basically get a few fouls for free, didn't you, at the start of the game, where you could just basically kick your opponent up in the air, and everyone would say, "Oh, well done, Robbo," you know, and you'd like you'd run back and carry on, whereas. It was just agree, really, you know, and, it, and I suppose once that started to come about, you still had to be the best players could still handle that, couldn't they? So I remember seeing yeah. that reach in training, thinking, "Wow, this is just unbelievable!" How he, and in the games, how he could deal with like getting, you know, that challenge from behind early on. You yeah. know, see it come in the people's awareness was just unbelievable. And maybe yeah. the only thing I was thinking about in midfield is maybe because it was a bit more like that. You, you played a bit more earlier, maybe a bit more on one touch. You maybe had a bit more of a pitcher, I don't know. Yeah, mm. and, and that, that did help certain midfield players. But we've also talked about, because the ball was dropping in the air all the time, there was a tendency, I played maybe first or second division football. It just got hooked on all the time from midfield. No one really had the bravery to get it down and play because of the game was so congested. Um, yeah, that's right. I think, I think... That's another thing, isn't it? The the offside has changed, isn't it? So back back then when we played, there was a lot more offsides. As you mentioned, Robo, the game was more congested in the middle of the pitch. People were really looking for offsides and, and pushing up a bit more. Mm. And like I say, along with the the state of the pitches, um, you know, I remember being told to just like you, Robo, just hook it on, hook it on over the top of the opposition, just help it on, get it down and play. So, and I kind of, I, I actually struggled with that side of it because it wasn't what I wanted to do. It's not what I was enjoying about the game. And um, did it obviously because it was your job and it's, it's, you know, you're part of a team and you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to do for the good of the team. But there were times where I didn't really enjoy uh, my work. Um, but yeah, we, you know, uh, I think at that level, it's about winning, and if you're winning, and and 
and the fans wanted you to win, and that's that's that all, that's all that really mattered back then, I suppose. I think now it's got to be more of an entertaining win, and um, mm. so that's that's changed the game, I think. Um, yeah, the mentality, your mentality, you mentioned as I've mentioned in there is a big thing for me, and I think the other thing that I've, I've kind of as we we're talking there, John, is like the your coach or your manager is so crucial for how you develop as a player. If you've got a coach or a manager that is encouraging you to do, you know, something, well, whatever the manager says, you've got to try to do, haven't you? So it's, you know, whoever, you've just got to be lucky that you, if you get somebody that really plays the game or wants to play the game the way you feel the game wants to be played, I think that's, that's, uh, that's just the luck of the draw, isn't it? I think the other thing is, as a player, you've got to be able to adapt to what your managers want, you know, and different managers want different things and you, you've got to be able to deliver that if you want to have a long career, I think, I would say. Jordan, what's your what's your take on this? Your coaching balance, the title, the screen on the screen, it just says coaching balance between structure and freedom. I suppose that's how much do you want to be organised? Like you said before, when the ball's here, Jordan, I want you to stay here, that person's going to go on there and how much freedom do you want? What, what is the balance that's that you've seen what would be your your story around that um i would say you obviously need a, a i said it earlier like a, a framework and i think you do i would probably put high up on my list role clarity um wherever that was on the pitch you know whether we were pressing inside outside uh, are we pressing high or are we dropping into a four one four one block because of the team we're playing against but um I think if it's too structured, you become predictable, and um, you know. I think maybe you could you could try it for a season, but I think after that, you can you know teams can adapt and and start to shut off your strengths. Um, so I think you need freedom within that framework to allow players to to show what they can do. But I think obviously there's a fine balance of having the right players to do that. Um, you know, we're quite lucky at Arsenal. We're we're very adaptable and, and Joe, our manager, he likes to even play our centre midfielders out wide and have them as inside wingers. So we create like a box sometimes, um, you know, rather than an out-and-out -out winger that might stay high and wide and, and create that um, kind of role there. So I think you need that structure, but um, I think you also need to, as a manager, it's their job to know their players and know that they kind of have that adaptation in the team or actually do they need to um be a bit more defensive if maybe they can't they're not fit enough to high press for example and when you mentioned before it's about, interesting uh, Robert, we you talked about sorry Robert. no go on paul just just going to mention there about the um i think jordy sort of about uh, Robert, you said about um pressing we used to press ways to show people inside. It's, that's that's another area of the game that changed, where everybody now, most or most teams, want to you're not and then you're not coming through the middle of us. You're going outside of the team. So just comparing what happens more or less a lot of times now to what used to happen when when I played was that we was, used to show people inside into the into the group. Um, it's interesting that most teams now do want to show their opponents out outside. And you know, Paul, in, you, in the great Arsenal team, when you said you were so organised that you you then lacked a bit of freedom. What? Go on, do you want to explain that to yeah. to me and Jordan? Yeah. So I, I think um, when when George Graham came to the club in '87, and um, he'd done really well because he. He came into a club that was going nowhere really. We didn't the players that at the time weren't sort of motivated and he completely changed that around. And so eighty eighty seven, um his first season we won won the Lewis Cup. Um and that was our first trophy in like sort of eight or nine years and he won it in his first season. So and he did that by good organisation, good structure. And as Jordan said, you know, people knowing their roles. Um, but he had a good young group of players coming through, Dave Castle, Tony Adams, um, Michael Thomas. Um, and so 
he blended it in with one or two of the older ones like himself and he got a good team spirit going so I think um, George was good for all of us at that point but there, there came a point where I think we, we just wanted to after three or four years just, it became a little bit more conservative we weren't as free flowing as we used to be and um, I think then that's when it started to feel like a real proper job for a lot of us. And I remember um, having personal disagreements with George around how he was playing. And, uh, and one or two of the other players, actually. Uh, Mike, I remember Michael Thomas having disagreements with the manager. I wouldn't recommend having disagreements with your manager because you, you just get dropped out of side and that's it. Back then, anyway. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so it became a little bit difficult sort of four or five years in to really enjoy the work. Um, although we were still winning, but it wasn't as enjoyable as it was previously. So, yeah, and there's that, there's that balance that's to be had, isn't there, between like winning and the way you win. Um, and it still goes on today, you know, fans get upset. Um more so now, I think, and if if you're winning, but uh, look how many managers get the sack or have to move on, even though they're doing okay. It's the style of play. Back in the day, it didn't matter if you won; it didn't matter about the style. It's just about the winning. So I think the game has obviously evolved and got better in that respect for for the fans and I think for the players as well. If you if you're enjoying what you're doing, I don't know. It's like Jordan for you guys in terms of enjoying your work and you see it as as you know part of what you do you want to enjoy it I, I think the reason i love arsenal so much is down to the way we play um you know wanting to get on the ball um having that freedom to 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 move with other players and um you know i think the, the main reason i've stayed at the club is just purely on uh, the way our tactics are and how we like to play football you know Obviously, I've said before, I'm small. I think if we played a long game or, you know, I'm, they're asking me to head balls or, or kick a ball from a goal kick to me, I'd be going, well, I'm not I'm not your player. I'm not your person. Um, but then, you know, Mark Sampson, he kind of was a different coach where we played a, a 4-4-2 system. And um, I think a lot of the players would admit we didn't enjoy it at all. But actually, he created such a defensive mechanism that we started winning games and we started counter-attacking on teams, but we kind of had to go a year, maybe even a year and a half of saying, Mark, like, please let us play football. But actually we weren't at that level yet. And I think he was very clever at um, kind of changing that a little bit to, and like you said, we started winning. So then we're like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll give and take a little bit with this. Um, but, you know, I think it can only go on so long until um, you still want to then enjoy your game and, um, you know, Mark obviously then started to adapt on us then playing football once we defensively got stronger. Yeah, the, the biggest challenge as a, as a coach, isn't it, as a player, it, it's to understand, I suppose, how you, as you just explained brilliantly then, how individually you want to enjoy your game. You and Paul are both, I think, explained that very, very well. But also want to be in a team that's winning and being successful, isn't it? You want both, don't you? You want to have the capability and the structure to to really excel and be the best player you can be. But also you want to play in a winning side that, that people know their roles. As you said, Jordan, role clarity, and that is crucial about how do we play? Um, what are the role, role responsibilities for the team members? You know, how, how do we got, go about doing that? You know, I also think it's interesting what, I suppose, what you both say about your mentality, about your own like individual style, I think is really interesting. You know, that, you just said it, Jordan, about the style of play has to link to you as somehow, doesn't it? You know, it's not saying that the team's wrapped around you as an individual. And the same with Paul, as you said about Michael Thomas and others. But the individuals in the midfield got to say, look, we've got to play. You know, we've got to do certain things that are going to make us feel good about how we play the game. Um, Jordan, is, is there anything you want to add from your midfield masterclass experiences over the last 15 years that that you two Arsenal legends want to add in the last, last couple of minutes for your last comments? No, uh, just I've enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, I think if I was a, a little girl playing again, I would uh, want to play in the midfield all over again. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds a good message. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I agree. I'd agree with Jordan. I think the midfield area has always been where all the action has been, hasn't it? Um, and so I was like, I was, I was pleased to have been able to play in that part of the pitch because it was, I think it still is, I think where all the action goes on, you know, it's all going on around you. It's, uh, you're kind of involved in the game. So, yeah, for me, and you know, it's funny because I, when I grew up, when I was younger, I was a, I was a striker. So when I, I was scoring goals when I was 9, 10, 11, and then when I went to Arsenal, they dropped me back into midfield. I think they thought I was too slow to get up front. <laughs> so that's one thing I didn't mention. I wasn't the quickest. <laughs> so it was probably best I dropped dropped back into midfield. And uh, but no, it's it's just just great to to play the game, isn't it? And to be able to, for us, Jordan and myself, to be able to play for such a club and, and for such a long period of time, I think you're always grateful for that um and to play with so many so many great players over the years it's um it's great it's, it's when you look back on it it's it's afterwards i think Jordan, when you finish you you'll i think you'll appreciate it doubly doubly more i think it's something that i'm sure you're the same i don't know if you look back on your career and more that more you finish after you finish and people have got time to reflect a bit i think you look back and you think, well, there's some good bits there. Yeah, I think so. I think being a professional footballer, as Jordan said, is, that is should be every girl or every boy's dream, isn't it? To try and play professional football when you're interested in the sport that we that, that we love. You know, I think it's been great listening to you about your insights from midfield. You're clearly two unbelievable, you know, inspirational role models who, you know, happen to played for and are playing at a fantastic club. Um, Jordan, really appreciate your time. I know you're busy getting ready for the WSL to get going. I hope you can win many more league titles and cups and European uh, Champions Leagues at, at Arsenal over the next number of years and, and maybe we'll get a bit closer to winning Euros or a, or a World Cup with the, with the national side. So we wish you all the best. Um, yeah. hope the next few seasons go really well. Or the next X number of seasons go really well, I should say. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, um, Paul, thanks again for your for your insights. Um, as always, good to spend time with you and chat about your career. I think we also talk about, you know, talking about some things from yesteryear, just making sure they're current, aren't they? You know, we don't want to talk about what happened back in the day is, you know, we, it's all our yesterdays. It's 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 like in this discussion how you can use some of those principles and relate them to, to working with modern day players and modern day coaches with um the style sort of issues that are floating around, the quality of the pitches, the quality of, you know, the staff and the systems, you know, I think, I think it's important to to discuss how football's evolved over the last X number of years and long may these discussions continue. So thanks again. Thanks for your time. And, uh, Pleasure, thanks for having us on. Thank you. Thanks for having us.